Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ultimate Guitar interview with the great Frank Bello. Uh, Frank, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Justin. How are you, man? Thanks for having me from where you are to where I am in my basement in New York, in Westchester, New York, and uh, I realize I have to clean. <laughs> it looks like to... you got a bit of clutter there. That's, that's great. You know, though. I'm a clutter guy, and you know what? I just recently bought most of my guitars in my in my house. Uh, a lot, mo a lot of my guitars. Uh, I need to. My wife came down here. She goes, "No, this is like my, my my shameless promotion kind of vibe here." You know, you could see the record, the EP, the Tech Twenty One stuff, the pedal. So it's a selfless promotion, um, shameless promotion. But uh, yeah, I, I have to. This is this is this week's project for sure. I, I need to um, clean up a little bit. Sorry. Yeah, we'll get into all that stuff behind you because you got a lot going on this year. Uh, what is the rest yeah. of 2023? 20, I had to think of what year it was just yeah, now. Me too, me. I know. So uh, I ordered the book that you have behind you. Uh, right, fantastic you. read. I'm really enjoying it. You're a fantastic writer. Ah, thank you. And uh, my co-writer, Joe McIver, has to, I have to give him props because he, uh, without him and a bottle of uh, a bottle of vodka, right? Where I'm sitting right here, <laughs> well, that uh, I don't think I would have gotten through that book because it brought up a, brought up a lot of stuff and the great the great feedback and the great reviews we've had <clears throat> and the sales, thankfully, we're getting is I don't think people they know it's not just your your obligatory rock and roll book. It's it's really where I wanted to come from. I wanted to connect with people and stuff I've been through, and uh, apparently from the feedback we're getting and the reviews. And the great emails and letters and comments I'm getting, uh, people are really connecting because with my trials and tribulations I had through my life, my death of my brother, abandonment of my dad, he took off when I was 10 years old. People are really connecting with that and um, and really digging in on the essence of the book, which is really, a, it's about family. I don't know, you push down enough times in your life, uh, you got to pick yourself up and brush off. And the only way I knew how is just to keep going forward. And I think a lot of people are connecting with that because a lot of people when you get shit on, man. You don't like getting shit on. You gotta, you gotta rise up and move on. And uh, I guess this book is helping people do that, which is great for me to hear. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a book that advocates music as a therapeutic outlet. And I think that's the great, great takeaway that I've taken away so far. I'm not through the whole thing yet, but uh, absolutely. Yeah. Justin, so that's what else really would we powerful. be without music? The outlet. I look at it this way. I equate it like this. What would we be without music? Like I know me growing up when the hurt of my dad taking off and having, you know, being abandoned and then having no money because he took off. My mother didn't have a job and going on welfare, all that stuff. The only thing that filled that void, that hole that I felt, that sorrow, whatever you want to call it, angst, all, all in one, one big ball in your gut. The only one thing that was a constant soothing thing what for me was music it was my outlet it was my it's the thing that made me feel better and i look i'm very very grateful for music and very grateful for the living i've made and and the career i've had i'm very grateful for that i know how lucky i am i don't i don't uh take that for granted um but music for me is the spice of life it really is it still is to this day i'm just i'm writing just before we started to talk dude uh, I'm, I'm I'm writing some some stuff that I think is great, and it made me, you know, I'm just in a good mood. I, I I don't know how to explain it. It just gets me to where I need to be. It's like taking a pill, a happy pill. I pick up a guitar somehow, or I just put my headphones on. Somehow, that makes the chemicals in my brain soothe out, man. And and uh, I'm still thankful for it. You know. You know, I was surprised to learn. I guess I wasn't super surprised to learn in the book that uh kiss had a very heavy influence on you as i'm just so shocked in all the interviews i've done over the years how kiss is this recurring thing that comes up as this just driving force man they really shook the earth what was it about kiss that really drew you in and made you a fan of of music well and i'm really honest with this in the book too i, I just say it straight out look coming from where i came from I needed heroes. When your dad takes off and you're looking for somebody to look up to or something to look up to, you're searching. That's what happens when you're a kid. You're just like, all right, how could I emulate that? When I saw Kiss, I said, it's over. That's what I want to do. This is it for me. I'm, I'm in. All in. I, all in. I knew I had a goal. That was my goal in life. I want to get on stage and do that. I want to play these amazing songs, something like it. I want to do my version. But um, that was my goal. And it really gave me 
a, a serious <clears throat> focus about where I wanted to go uh, at that at a young at a young age because. <clears throat> All I could think about, I have to finish school and I have to get onto a stage. I have to learn this craft, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I just love it. <clears throat> That's why I'm a proponent of making people and younger kids, older people, play. Just try an instrument. If you play four notes, two notes, I don't care what it is. Just get that feeling. That I, just, I want you to have the same high. I put that forward in the book also. I think it's so important. Being that we're a guitar-centric yeah. publication, uh, you're a bass player. Why did you land on bass? What was it about that instrument or that those frequencies that really spoke to you? Well, funny enough, 13, 12, 13 years old when I was playing, <clears throat> I started to play, started on rhythm guitar like a lot of people do. A lot of bass players have actually started on, on guitar. Um, my drummer, Charlie Benanti in Anthrax, you guys probably know him. Uh, we grew up together. We're related. So we grew up in the same house together. We jammed. We jammed. And I would watch what he does. He was, he was, he was always a great drummer and he played guitar also. So I started to jam with him, guitar and learning all that stuff. And I was playing the bass parts on guitar. And it was he who said to me, you're playing the bass parts again. And that's, I just heard that first, you know, but again, I write like this stuff. I, the EP I have and, and all this, this stuff I write, the stuff I write for Anthrax is on guitar. So I always like, there's nothing better than just jamming on a guitar, like just sitting in the, an acoustic, I just love both. But I hear bass first. That just happens. But I think they're, they're, they're a great combination. But I love the bass. I do. I, uh, and plus, it's two less strings, so it's easy. No, but um, honestly, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, I write. I, I enjoy writing with a guitar. I, don't, I, I rarely write with bass. I write my bass lines with a bass or anthrax and stuff like that. But um, guitar and, and music, I write with a guitar. I still love guitar. Is that where the songwriting process starts for you? Uh, does it start on guitar or bass? Are you looking for that rhythm to uh, to build upon when you're writing, either with Anthrax or with your solo project? That's a great question, you know, because sometimes it's a melody. I write a lot of the anthra Anthrax melodies, and it just happens to ha work like that. Um, you hear a melody, and it's like, hey, this part, I could just chunk on something on, on the bottom of this melody because the mo melody is so strong, it doesn't need a big thing on the bottom of it. Because the melody is so strong, and, and vice versa. Sometimes a great riff will come up, and say, "All right, I can." This melody will go f right over that. It's a one-two punch. It really works back and forth. That's the way it works with me. It's funny enough. I bring my phone everywhere, man. For Anthrax, the other day, we're recording a new Anthrax record, writing some uh, lyrics and melodies, and I had this song. Was playing the song in my head, the Anthrax song, and all of a sudden the melody came up. Grab the phone, done. It's just. It just comes to you like that, you know, record it. Yeah, but it's it's hand in hand with, with writing, man. So you mentioned the new uh, Anthrax record. So I got to ask, where are you guys at in the uh, tracking or recording or writing process um, as far as that record goes? Um, we're recording guitars, drums. I'm actually recording my bass next month. And when, when Anthrax done, does these days, we do a, bulk, a bunch of songs together, like a bulk of songs. Uh, I think we have eight or nine right now. And we'll keep writing what we're doing. Um, and I think that's important. To, that's what we did the last record, and it came out the way we wanted it to. Um, and we have a good bulk of songs right now that we that we know already, um, but we still we want to have a couple of more. So that's that's the way we go. We'll digest these for a while. Uh, I'll do my bass next week, uh, next month. Then the vocals will come on, and we'll have this locked up. Then we'll start writing a few more songs, and uh, then we'll choose what are the what's best for the record and how the how the uh, the record goes. We're hoping, um, oh, my friend, because it's been a while, man, uh, next year. It's been eight, I think almost eight years from, from the last record. I want to have a record out. We all do. I want to hear, you know, I can't wait to play new songs, all this stuff. I want to go on tour, but um, it has, it's got to be right. Did you guys try to put stuff together during the pandemic as far as sending files back and forth, or is that just not how Anthrax works? Do you guys like to be in the studio together when you're, when you're writing and recording? We actually got together periodically. Uh, but during the pandemic, when everything was locked down, I, I live in New York, we were really locked down. It was really ridiculous when it first started. And everybody's doing that jamming over, over you know, the internet and all that. That's great. And I think, I think that satisfied a lot of people. I thought that was great. That was fun. But um, with Anthrax, the three of us have to be in a room and looking at each other and, and vibing. And it, it's spontaneous and it's, it's locked in. You know it. And you do it like this, and I love this, but the latency, there's a second delay. Imagine just jamming like that. It's like, would you play there? You know, oh, and it stops the vibe. 
And all of a sudden, you're, you're taking apart the song for no reason. It's like, all right, this isn't the way to do it. We have to get together. And that, so that's what we did. And I think it was a smart move because um, we won't put out, put out anything we don't live. You know, and it's got to be right. It's got to be exactly the record that we're coming out with. That's that that's who we are. You know, I've always felt that your music's very authentic and very genuine, and it comes from a very real place. I think that's what connects with people, especially myself. You guys have been playing together for forty years. Yeah, we should uh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's funny what? you say that, man. I thought about that when you see the number forty, and we did this whole fortieth anniversary thing, man. Um, and it's great, great celebration. But as you get older, as a musician in this world, and you see how it all changes, like they took the record company business away from us, right? Where you have to stay on the road to make a living to feed our families, right? That's just the way it is, dude. It's it's black and white in front of your face. Those checks aren't coming in the way they used to because there is no record company business. That's just the way it is. So you stay on the road and no matter how old you get, no matter how much your back hurts, and I love playing, so it doesn't matter to me. I'm a yoga guy. I try to keep my, my ass in shape and all that stuff. But it is harder than any other time that we've had. I feel bad for the younger bands coming up today because I want to see, I want to pass the torch and I want to see younger bands come up and write a great record and, and be that next next great rock or metal thing. And um, it's, just, it's so much harder now. But the, but the one thing they have is the internet. So that's the balance. So use it as much as you can. I, I tell all the young players like that, you got to use it, man. That's what you, that's what's given to you. We didn't have any of that when we were younger. We just stayed on the road and played every corner in the world that we could. Are there some newer bands out there that you feel are capable of carrying that flag forward as far as thrash music goes? There's a lot. There's a lot going on out there. But for me, I just want to, I want to hear somebody step out and, and be themselves. You know what I mean? Look, I like a band like Turnstile, right? I love that. It's heavy and it's raw. I just like what they're doing. It's straight here. Those guys are going to be headlining everywhere soon, right? You know what I mean? I, I look forward to stuff like that. I, that's what makes me say, yeah, all right, we're going to be okay. In terms of band dynamics, as we mentioned, you know, 40 years together in buses and vans, man. Uh, <laughs> brothers fight. Uh, there's always going to be disagreements and artistic uh, differences. Uh, how do you, how have you guys learned to work through that? And what advice can you give younger bands that are maybe struggling with some of that stuff? That's a great question. And are you in a band? Justin? I'm not. Well, I, I was going to use some of your experience. That's why um, and for the younger people who are in a band or are starting a band, just be prepared. Look, I've seen Scott Ian, Charlie Benanti, you know, all the guys in my band, Joey Belladonna, more than I've seen my family in my life in my think about that so you got to realize it's that and you learn to have respect there's no time for ego what happens with ego it it gets you out of the band and the band doesn't work and you want to get out and you want this guy out and get rid of your ego first off it's not about you it's about the band it's about music solid advice so you mentioned you'll be recording your tracks next month uh, yep. Do you have a pretty solid idea of what you're going to be using for gear in there? Have you changed it up in the last eight years since the last record? I'm loyal to a fault, Justin. Um, my Harky LH-1000s haven't done anything wrong to me. In my pedal, I don't know if we're going to talk about this. Now, I can't show it. I have, a, I have the prototype here, but I'm not sure if my favorite company, Tech 21, um, uh, the, we have a pedal coming out uh, within the next month or two. Uh, it's called... Um, the Street Driver 48. I had, to, I had to look at it just to make sure it was a Street Driver 48. It's uh, they're calling it. It's like a Sans amp on steroids, which is the ultimate compliment because we did we went deep. I've been very fortunate in my career for people really liking the sound of my bass that comes through with the Anthrax record, and I'm very proud of that and I'm very thankful for that. I don't record until I hear that. I don't even play live until I hear that sound. It had to cut through Charlie Benanti's drums, his kick drum specifically, and Scott Ian's thick guitar playing. Do you know the, the bass player Tom Peterson from Cheap Trick, one of my favorite all-time bass players, and just a great dude. I love him. Um, it's right, his bass sound is just incredible. Doug Pinnick from King's X, another guy. We Doug and I talk about this all the time about Tom Peterson's bass sound. You know, uh, Tom played an eight and twelve string bass that always had this piano top top end sound that just highlighted the bass, and it just really cut through without losing the bottom. I still long for that sound, and I think we really did a good job because we were we went at it for this pedal. I think people that like my sound, when they hear this pedal, a lot of people have been asking me about 
and asking Tech 21 when this is coming out. It's coming out within the next two months. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. How long has this been in production? I know a lot of times uh, you have a prototype there. I would imagine that's not the first prototype that you've that you've had and road tested and sent back with notes. Exactly that, Justin. Um, that's what happens. And I was fortunate enough to be on the road when they sent me my first prototype. And um, it, it was awesome. I can't wait for people to hear and play this thing uh, because the, the people at Tech 21, who I trust, who I value their opinion of, they're really, they said, this is going to be one of the best ones. And I, for me to hear that from that company, man, yes, this is exactly what I wanted to do. They've done great stuff in the past, and I expect this pedal to be uh, right on par, if not exceeding that. So, Thank you, Jess. I hope you like it. So I wanted to touch on your solo EP. Is that pedal uh, maybe making in its first appearance on your solo EP? It will, because it just came out. I have more stuff I'm writing right now for solo stuff. And this is an EP, EP called uh, Then I'm Gone. It came out over a year ago. And uh, it came out, this was the answer to the book, because what happened, I don't know if you guys know this, but when you write a book, especially about your family and your upbringing, um, it brings back a lot of emotion. What happens, you go through your family stuff and the stuff that I thought I went through therapy and got rid of and I compartmentalized and I put it away. Well, when I started going through this stuff, the, the death of my brother, uh, my brother was murdered when I was 23. It was a very traumatic thing in my, my life. When that came up again, it was right here in my face again. When I was writing the book, uh, some the abandonment of my dad, all the trials and tribulations people go through. Everybody's got their story, but this came and it was right here. And after I finished writing the book, it was still there. And I said, all right, what is always my go-to uh, when I'm in a bad way? Writing, music, right? My outlet. Picked up a guitar, started writing songs. And because there was a lot there, a lot. And um, there you go with the EP. And if you guys haven't checked it out, it's, it's on iTunes. It's everywhere. So um, check it out on YouTube first if you like it. If you like it, check it out and uh, pick it up. It's a neat three-song EP. Really excited about it. People digging it. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put out periodic um, songs. I think that's the way to do it nowadays instead of full-length records. Uh, eventually, uh, people ask me if I'm going to do, do touring and stuff. And uh, eventually, eventually, when it's time, when it's right. And uh, talking to some people about that now, <clears throat> Anthrax is my first priority, obviously. So when that when the studio stuff goes away, then maybe I'll <clears throat> do some shows. We always expect uh, solo EPs to take on a little more of a personal nature. Uh, as far as your work in Anthrax, is there a song that means the most to you personally? Uh, yeah, Volume 8. Anthrax wrote a record called Volume 8. I don't know if you know this or not, Justin. It's a hidden track uh, on Volume 8 that a lot of people have found. And maybe they'll find it now again. Uh, where my brother, I, we talked about this before the book stuff. Um, my brother was murdered at 23 years old. I... Um, like everything else I do in my life, if something's going on, I have to pick up a guitar. Uh, the only way I, I had to go on tour in, in two weeks, three weeks to go play Japan, and I was really all over the place with my head. Uh, I didn't want to do anything. I just didn't understand what, how he could be taken and all that stuff. So I wrote this song called, for my brother, he's called Anthony. And it's a hidden track on volume eight that the guys were, the guys in my band, they were they were just, just great. I don't know the word for it. They're just, they were just, they really came to my aid there. They really did. And they said, look, um, we don't think it's an anthrax song. And it's not an anthrax song. It was a very personal song. It was a message to me, my, my brother, Anthony, that I'll see you again. And just give me, giving hope and all that stuff. So many people have caught onto that song because it's a hidden track on volume eight and identified with, it, with their loss. Look, I, I'm glad that they did because this was very personal to me. And I just did it to heal myself. But so many people have written me, <clears throat> and it chokes me up now to this day because the lyric content on it. It really um, it gives you hope that um, when a, a close person in your life has passed, your, your dream is to see them again, and your belief. My belief is I'll see him again somewhere, whatever, whatever you belief you have. But uh, for my brother Anthony, I know I'll see him again, and that's my belief. Uh, and a lot of people have caught on to that, and it gives them hope. If you ask me to go back to it, that, that connects with me. There's a lot of great Anthrax songs that you know, I've written with the guys. It was just a beautiful thing to let me have that song on that record. As much as we love to geek out about gear and tone and all that <laughs> stuff, uh, those are the songs that hit you the hardest. Uh, the lyrics are in the book. Uh, the great backstory behind yeah. the song or the tragic backstory behind the song. Yeah. Um, there's some heavy stuff in that book, man. I, I salute yeah. you for making it through that because I know it yeah. wasn't easy. Yeah. 
it's it's not a book. Look, I didn't see that coming. You know, Joel McGuire and I have been talking about for years about writing a book, about me getting my story out and all that stuff. And he knew there was a lot of great stuff. And he, I called him up when when COVID started in this room, in this basement. I called him up. I said, Joel, it might be the time because I was in here. I was just writing songs. Nobody can go out, right? And that was it. We did it as you and I are talking right now, Justin. That's how we did it. And I had a bottle of vodka and no time. Big thing of tissues right here from the stuff we were just talking about. And yeah. And again, I have to say this about the book. There's also a lot of great rock and roll stories in it too. Uh, so uh, if you like, you know, the stuff of Metallica, all that stuff, there's a lot of great fun off, off touring stuff, the big four stuff, all that great stuff. Um, so I don't want people to think it's like, just like this self help, help, self help thing, but it's also, it's both. It's got a little bit of everything. So that's what I'm very proud of. It's got a little bit of everything. Seeing you guys live is, is a lot of fun. You guys bring so much energy to the stage nice. and, uh, knowing from trying to learn some of your songs and failing miserably, um, a lot of your songs are very technically difficult to play. Are there some songs or some parts of songs that come up in the set list and you're thinking, oh shit, this part's coming up. I really need to focus here. Um, what are some of the most uh, challenging parts to play live? You know, I used to think that about what got the time for the bass solo and all that stuff. But that song became so popular with the crowds and, and the fan base. I don't think about it anymore. I guess when you think too much, you know, the whole solo thing, like, oh, here comes the bass solo. Like, I'm not a bass solo guy. I'm just not. I, I like playing bass. I like making little songs within songs with my bass lines. But to, to go out the spotlight with the bass solo was never my thing. But with Got the Time, that was a Joe Jackson song. There was a bass solo in it. Okay, fine. I made my own bass solo up. And it goes over great. And thank God, when I see the fans' faces, when they see me play it, it makes it all, oh, my God. It's like, yeah, that's why I'm doing this. A song called Skeletons in the Closet. I say, all right, this is a challenge. But... I'm at this age now where I, I'm looking for the challenge. But I don't think I'm any guru of bass. I just love bass. I love that bouncing off other musicians. Come on, man. That's what my, my favorite guys are the bass players that I, I jam with. JD from Black Label. You ever see the guy play by himself? Yeah. He's incredible. Rob from Metallica. You ever see him play? And he's great with Metallica. You ever see him play without Metallica on his own? He's incredible. There's a lot of great. Dave Ellison. There's so many great players that I love bouncing off of. As a tab site, are you familiar with Ultimate Guitar? Do you use tabs? I don't use tabs. You know, when, it's funny because when I grew up <clears throat> in high school, I was in jazz class. I played stand-up. I was never allowed to play on the electric bass in my in my jazz class because uh, I guess the teacher had her favorite player. But So I, I, I did love the extension. I was learning the extension and all that stuff on, on the, on the stand-up. The teacher wasn't there. I would go to the electric and jam with my friend, John Tempesta. You know John Tempesta from The Cult? He plays in The Cult. He's a drummer. Ooh. Yeah, he's, he's a drummer. He used to play for Rob Zombie. He's, he's, uh, he's playing drums in The Cult right now. And uh, we used to, we went to high school together. We used to jam heavy metal songs. So I used to grab the bass, uh, the, the electric bass, and he used to play Iron Maiden. Uh, we used to play Judas Priest, all except we used to jam all this heavy metal stuff. And my teacher would, we'd get in there early and she'd come in and she'd just throw us both out and put send it to the principal. It's a side thing that I've always loved doing this and keeping keeping this club going. Music, it makes us feel good. That, that's a pretty cool thing. And one of the coolest things to me about this club is there's a lot of kids picking up uh, the instrument and they're beginning their journey. To that kid who just got his first bass, uh, what advice do you have to that kid? I say it at my clinics, step by step, day by day, minute by minute. You have people from their 60s and you have kids in their teens coming to my coming to my clinics and I just do the same thing. It's like that maybe the sixty year old's just starting bass. Maybe he's intimidated. He's like this. I don't know what to do, right? There's nothing better than that. I mean, my first thing is I come up on stage here with me. I put the bass on them. Ah, it's that magic moment. And I'll just take them through three notes. Dude, I'll just take them through the first, you know. Frank Bello signature. Yeah. <laughs> Shovel sure, had to do that. It's a shameless plug, but I just take him through it. And um A E E F F F F you know, F sharp. I'll take them through three or four notes, make them feel they're on a stage, they're in front of people, and they're playing. Because I think people forget this is playing music. You're not working music, right? You have to play and feel good. When you play, you feel good. And, and the, the look they have in their face from the 60 year I've done it with both. 
60 year old dudes uh, or girls and coming on the stage and just getting that first step out. That first step is everything. Cause once you have a little confidence, look, you go to the, then you go into the, taking that next step, all of a sudden you're progressing. And that's the step you need. Once you break the ice, man, then you're off and running. As long as you got your base. Do you mind yeah. showing us uh, some of the stuff you've been working on? Or do you want um, us to wait for the record for that? Um, I, I, can't. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't play the riffs right now. That would be bad. This I is, love that bass, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I'm really proud of this bass, um, the Charvel, uh, Frank Bellow's signature Charvel. If you haven't seen this yet, we worked on this bass for a while. This is the, this is the bass I've had in my head for about eight or nine years right now. And um, my good friend, Mike Tempesta from Charvel and Jackson, uh, we worked on this together. Uh, everything I asked for, they gave me. And I can't be happier than, with this thing. Um, it's, it's got uh, my maple neck, my poplar wood um, body, which I love. Now, this is another shameless plug. Get ready for it. Frank Bello Signature EMG Pickups. So um, please, if you haven't checked them out, if you like power and my sound and you know, what I do, um, we, we took a while to get these. And uh, they're finally ready. So uh, check these out. A lot of people are digging these pickups. And there's a lot of output, to say the least. Uh, yeah, and pretty much, dude, this is a, good, a great combination base of, if you like precision and jazz, it's right in the middle. I, I got to ask about uh, one of the songs that was that really got me, that expanded my mind. Because you know us metal guys can get pretty uh, entrenched in this is metal, this is not. We can't listen yeah. to that. Uh, of course, bring the noise, you know. Yeah. Uh, what is your recollection of that recording process? And were you surprised by the success of that song? Well, it's funny how that happened. My guitar player, Scott Ian, came up with the idea, which I thought was great because he got me into Public Enemy. So if you if you know Public Enemy at all, they're just a he it's, it's heavy. It's just heavy. Chuck's voice alone is heavy. It's one of the deepest, baddest, amazing voices ever. And I love it. He came up with the idea we should do this cover song. I'm in. Of course. How do we do it? And he came up with this riff. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Over over the vocals. Yeah. Okay. Chuck will go on top and we can collaborate. It, it was as easy as that. It just went, sent the, sent the music over to Chuck. Chuck loved it. Made it work. And for all the people back then, you got to remember this. I don't know if people know this, but people say that wouldn't work. They said, it's not going to work, this collab, and we can't bring this on tour because there's going to be problems in, this, in, the, in the audiences with um, this fights and all that stuff. And I'm telling you, that was most one of the most successful tours we've done and fun tours. And then the crowds were insane. Those, those were insane. It, we did a video of it, for God's sake. So that vibe just goes to show you anything can happen in music. That's the way I look at it. There should be no boundaries. There should be no boundaries in music. you got to experiment and try different things always. Yeah, that was a groundbreaking song for, for me as being very young when that came out. That was really cool. And uh, I think you made an important point uh, about playing music rather than working music. Being on tour is hard work, and <laughs> you guys always seem to have fun with it uh, based on the times that I've seen you. You like to bust each other's balls, too. So what's the best uh, prank you've played on each other uh, through the years? On each other or other bands? Well, on other bands. You? Oh, <laughs> my favorite prank, prank of all time, of all time for Anthrax, there's been a lot. It has been, I mean, because we're ball busters. We're New York guys. We're sarcastic, but in a fun way. We don't want to hurt anybody, but it's called ball busting to keep it fun. I guess that's all it, because we've been together for so long, that's how to keep it fresh, right? And keep it, each other on the toes and stuff. My favorite of all time was we were on tour. <clears throat> was it uh, Clash of the Titans? I think. It's Slayer and Megadeth, Alice in Chains opening. This is on YouTube. You guys can look this up. Slayer was on, I think, their last song. I don't know if it was Angel of Death. There's, you know when they set up the lights, these all these big things up? We had a line come all the way down, and we bought the biggest fucking fish we could, right? So the thing was with Slayer back then, you could never make them crack up on stage. It was very serious and stuff like that. Our thing was to bust balls and make them crack up. <laughs> they were into the song. It's Fucking brutal, and I love Slayer, so they're, they're great friends of mine. They were into it. Everybody's fucking da -da 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 -da, riffing out and all that stuff. Tom's at the vocal mic, right? Right in front of Tom's mic, dude. Right? And slowly, this huge fish comes right in front, like out of nowhere. It looks like out of the fucking sky, right? It just comes right in front of him, right? He looks, 
And all of a sudden, you see him. He looks to the side. He sees us. We're fucking crying. We're crying. He broke up. <laughs> and Tom, if you know Tom, man, he's got the best personality in the world. He's hilarious. Um, it was just one of those great pranks that worked really well. And it was just exactly what you wanted to happen. It all worked out. It's, it came out, it came down so slowly and deliberate. You know what I mean? It was so slow and deliberate the way they did it. And it right, dude, it was right in front of him. So you couldn't get away. It was so good. So yeah, that's still, still to this day, my favorite prank. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. It was fun. Well, well thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, dude, Justin, this went fast, dude. This is awesome. It man. did. I loved you guys forever. So, um, thank you for having me. And, uh, um, New Anthrax next year. Psyched about it, but uh, hope you guys hope we could do this again, Justin. Absolutely, me too. Um, thank you so much for taking the time, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on the road soon. Be safe out there. Enjoy your time in the studio. Thanks, brother. You take care of yourself.